everyone. Welcome to Appleton Online. Thank you for joining us for our midweek Bible study. I trust that you have had a blessed week, and I pray that you have great expectations about even greater things in the remainder of the week uh, to come. And we're going to be looking into the Word of God this evening at Psalm 119. Uh, we've been in a series now. This will be three weeks uh, as we have been discussing the necessity for studying the Word of God. I believe without a doubt it is the most important thing that a believer can do to equip themselves to be everything that God wants us to be. Uh, if we don't study the Word, it's like uh, not eating when we should or exercising as we should or taking care of our physical body. The Word of God is what takes care of the spiritual man. And as we'll read uh, here in just a few minutes, you find out that it's the answer for every situation of life. So, so it is what we need in every circumstance, whether it's emotional, physical, financial, spiritual, relational, you name it, the Word of God has the answer for it. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into our study this evening. Father, we are so thankful for the privilege of being able to gather around your word and study it like this. I pray that you would help me to teach it and declare it and state it this evening with ease of understanding so that Christ is glorified and so that your people are edified. Lord, I pray that you would hide me in Jesus so that he's the only one that's seen and heard. I pray, God, that you would inspire us by the Holy Spirit of God to take what we learn and to apply it to our daily lives. Lord, to help us to, to dive into the Word and partake of the Word in, in such a manner that it changes everything about us, Lord. We ask this in the magnificent name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Uh, we're going to uh, read Psalm 119, verse number 11. This has kind of been the text uh, where we've been starting from for the past three weeks. It says, Your word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And we've been using as a title, Revealed Through Hiding. Now I know that sounds kind of weird. How can something be revealed if it's hidden? Well, we, we, need to, we need to learn what it means to actually hide something from a biblical context. The author of Psalm 119 appears to be David. We don't know for sure, but it, it appears to be David because the wording sounds like him. This writer of Psalm 119 was very passionate about what he was talking about, and David was a very passionate man about all that uh, he did. From worship to prayer to service, David was passionate about serving God. So Psalm 119 kind of looks like his style of writing. It is the longest chapter in the Bible with 176 verses that are broken down into 22 stanzas of eight verses each. Each one of those uh, 22 sections begins with one of the letters of uh, the Hebrew alphabet. And from beginning to end, this psalm sings the praises of God's Word with all of its uses and purposes. And I believe it truly is a tribute to the Bible. From beginning to end, you'll find the writer uses eight or ten different words uh, to describe the Word of God. He uses words like word, instruction, commands, precepts, laws, testimonies, judgments, statutes, truth, and so on and so on. From the first verse to the end, verse 176, the writer is talking about the necessity of the Word of God, and it's a, I believe it's a, a fitting place and a fitting verse to start with our text. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And, and we're back to that, that idea of reveal through hiding. How can something be revealed if it is hidden? Well, what we have to do is think in context of scriptural definitions instead of our daily use of words. The word hid, when we use it today, we would define it as keeping something out of sight or obscure. We would define it as to prevent something from being seen or to keep something a secret and to keep something unknown. And we know that's, that's not what God means. He doesn't want us to keep the word a secret. 
He, he doesn't want us to keep the promises of God out of sight. He wants them to be uh, see, uh, set so everyone can see. Jesus said that, uh, you, know, you know, we should be a city on a hill where everybody can come in view to it. Jesus said that, that if we have a, a lamp lit or a candle lit or a light, if we have that, we wouldn't put a basket over it, but we would set it on a pedestal so everyone can see it. So, so God isn't interested in us hiding the word away to the point to where it's not seen. The word hidden has a different meaning, and, and here's how it really defined and how we should accept it today. Number one is to keep and store and treasure. So we get that. We should, without a doubt, keep the Word of God and store the Word of God, and we should treasure uh, the Word of God. Definition two, it's to integrate into something. That's to mix it in and to make it one with. And so most definitely, he wants us to mix the Word of God into our life. Now, can I say, it's not just when we come to worship service that he intends for us to mix the Word in our heart. Uh, he intends for us to do it daily, every day we need to integrate the Word into our life. Thirdly, uh, hid is like leaven mixed in dough assimilates its own nature into the dough in which it is mixed. And so when you mix leaven in dough or yeast into dough, it mixes in there and the dough actually begins to take the properties of the leaven or the yeast. And, and that's what God wants. He wants us to hide the Word, to integrate the Word, to mix the Word uh, into our lives to such a degree that our life began to take on the nature of the Word and instead of us looking so much like the flesh and living so much like the flesh, this is actually how we become men and women of God when we hide the Word in our heart. Now if there was such a thing as an instruction manual for life, the Bible would absolutely be it. There are many that have said the Bible's incomplete, but a, a perfect God, an all-powerful God, an all-knowing God would never give us an incomplete or imperfect word. Our understanding about the word may be incomplete and imperfect, but God's word is not incomplete and it is not imperfect. You will find in, in the Holy Scriptures, you'll find every issue of life from personal relationships to occupational relationships the finances, marriage, child rearing, work ethics, death and grieving, sexuality, spiritual growth, and anything else that you can name outlined somewhere in the pages of God's Word. So it would do us well to pay attention to what God is saying. And that's actually what Solomon said in Proverbs 4. He said, my child, pay attention to my words. Listen closely to what I say. So it's very imperative that anytime we hear the Word or we read the Word and study the Word, we need to pay attention to what we're doing, uh, else we're not going to gain anything from it. The Word of God, reading and studying the Bible, coming to church and hearing preaching and teaching must not be just some mundane action that we do. We need to pay attention to what we're reading, to what we're studying, and to what we are hearing. Listen closely to what I say. Don't ever forget my words. Keep them always in mind. I like this verse right here. For they are the key to life. For those who find them, they bring health to the whole body. It's the key to life. It's the instruction manual for life, and it brings health to the whole body, emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially, relationally. The Bible is the key to life and it brings health to every part of your body. But what good is a key that opens a door if you don't stick it in the lock and turn it and use it? So it's, it's of necessity that we apply the Word of God. It's of necessity that we study it. It's of necessity that we hear it and receive it as often as we can. And I believe it's the responsibility of every person to open the pages of the Bible and find and research and study and live out the instructions that are given there. And I, I hear a lot of people tell me I'm not, good, I'm not a good student, Russ. I, I don't do well at studying. I wasn't a good student in school and so on. I get that, okay? I, I get that some people, uh, because of our way of life and, and because we, the way we've patterned ourselves, I get that we're not good students. I, I get that. I get, I get differing levels of 
being able to understand and, and, and see things. I get that. I, I understand that. But I also know that if you're born again, God has given you an advantage called the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. And the Holy Spirit will help you understand. He will help you see things. He will help you uh, perceive revelations of Scripture uh, that, that maybe you could not see just from your own uh, mind uh, set. He will help you see it and understand it. But you've just got to apply the principles of study. You've got to apply the principle of taking the time to read. You've got to apply the principle of saying, Hey, Lord, help me understand this. Help me get this. Help me see this because I want my life changed. It is impossible to study the Bible with any degree of understanding if you're not willing to engage your mind in some serious thought, if you're not willing to engage yourself in some serious talk as well, because we don't need to just hear it and think about it. We need to talk about it as well. This instruction manual for life will do you no good if you're not willing to read it and make an attempt with the help of the Holy Spirit to understand what it says. When you approach the Bible, you need to understand uh, that the Bible contains the very mind and the heart and the thought of God. Uh, this means that when we approach it, we already know that the Bible is going to be above our understanding because God's ways are higher than our ways. Uh, we also understand that there are things that we don't see and things that we can't imagine. The Bible itself says, Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has in store for us. And we kind of stop right there and say, Okay, well, there it is. I can't see or understand everything. But then it, the next verse says, But they've been revealed to us by the Spirit. Uh, so, so understand, yes, God's ways are higher. Yes, God's thoughts are wiser. But God has, has given us help of the Holy Spirit to help us to understand what we need to understand. For the past two weeks, we have considered quite a few reasons as to why we need to study the Word of God. I will remind you of them real quick, and then we'll talk about what we need to talk about today. Uh, we have learned so far that we should study so that we can obey God. Study so that our spiritual lives can grow. Study so that we can avoid error and false teaching. Study so you can teach others. Study to express love for God and His Word. Study with an open mind. Study God's Word because it is eternal. It lasts forever. We should, it's the only thing that's eternal, by the way. Why would we not study that? Study the Word because it's profitable for us. Study the Word because it uh, illuminates the path of life for us. Number 10 and 11, study the Word because it brings hope in every situation of life. And lastly, from last week, study the Word because it relates human experience as a warning. I've got just about three more that I want us to list tonight. Uh, so let's jump right into them. Number one, study the Word because it gives knowledge of eternal life. This is, this is extremely important. We study the Word because it gives knowledge of eternal life. The eternal life that we've been promised, the eternal life that we're supposedly seeking after uh, as we're pursuing Jesus Christ, uh, that, that's what he's referring to. The Bible gives us knowledge of eternal life. The Bible gives us the promise of eternal life. And we need to study the Bible because... It has the key, it has the answer to attain this that we're seeking after, this eternal life. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to Thomas uh, to strengthen his faith and to teach him that it was actually more blessed to believe without seeing. Jesus offered Thomas every sign that he asked for because Thomas was not with the disciples when Jesus appeared the first time. And he said, I, I, I want to see certain signs in order to believe. And I'm not going to believe unless I see these signs. And Jesus was so compassionate. He was so understanding of this man's lack of faith. And he offered him every sign that he asked for. Uh, he asked to see the print of the nails in his hands. He asked to put his finger in that print. He asked to, to place his hand in the pierced side of Jesus. And Jesus offered him every sign that he was seeking for. But what John says in the very next verse after this recording in John 20 causes us to see that what Jesus told Thomas wasn't just for him. 
it was for everyone that would come to Christ after his ascension. Because after this, when Jesus goes back to heaven, no one is going to be able to see him or touch him. So what proof will we have of eternal life after Jesus has gone back to heaven? And so he was telling this not just for Thomas. He was telling this and showing us this for every one of us since Jesus ascended. We've not been able to, you know, see him physically or touch him physically. And and, and so what is there that teaches us? What is there that builds faith and causes us to believe? John tells us, verse number 30 of John 20, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But watch this. But these are written. He's talking about the Word now. These things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life, that is eternal life, you may have life in His name. Now notice we, we understand and we learn these things right here. They are written. Well, the only way that we can learn something that is written is if we read it, if we study it, if we hear it taught and we pay attention to it and we apply it. That's the only way we can learn these things. So Jesus is, is telling us after he ascends, he, he's telling Thomas, Thomas, you know, it's better for you to believe and not have seen. Well, here we are on this side of his ascension, and we're in the same boat that Thomas was in. We can't see him physically. We can't touch him physically. And so we have the promise that Jesus gave to Thomas. It's better for us to have not seen and still believe. We have that promise, but we have this advantage that Thomas didn't have. We can go and read about all the things that Jesus did. And in reading and studying that, we gain knowledge of eternal life. All these things are written down so everyone can have a chance to believe in the eternal life that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. That's why we have the Word. They are written for us. This means we have to read it, we have to study it, we have to hear it. And without the Word of God, we would have no idea about this precious gift of eternal life if it weren't for God's Word. So yes, We should study because it has knowledge of and gives us hope in the concept of eternal life. 1 John chapter 5 says, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Watch this. He he talks about writing again. I write these things to you that believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. So again, he says, I'm writing to you so that you can know that you have eternal life. So the knowledge of eternal life, the hope of eternal life, it comes from the Word of God. And as we read it, as we study it, as we hear it taught and preached, we gain knowledge and hope in this great concept called eternal life. If we don't read the Word, if we don't study the Word, We don't know about this promise of eternal life. If we don't read and study the Word, we don't know about the promise of Romans 6, 23 that says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. If we don't read and study the Word, we don't know about the promise of 1 Timothy 6, 12 that says fight the good fight of faith and take hold of eternal life to which you're called. We're called to that. We're not just promised that, we're called to that. He wants us to possess that. But if we don't read the Word or hear the Word, we don't know that. If we don't read and study the Word, we don't know the promise of Titus 1 and 2 that says we have the hope of eternal life, which the God who never lies promised before the ages began. Wow. Hope of eternal life that comes from the God who never lies. Amen. Why should we not want to study the Word when it has the promise and the hope of eternal life and it is a promise that has come from the God who cannot lie? Study the Word because it gives knowledge of eternal life. Number two, this evening, study the Word because we're going to be judged by the Word. Now that's a, that's a very solemn thought, isn't it? 
to know that we're going to be judged by the Word. This is God's outline. The Word of God is, is, the, uh, is the template over which God's going to lay on top of our life and see does our life measure up to the standards that He has laid out in His Word. And so if we don't study the Word, if we don't know the Word, if we don't read the Word, if we don't hear the Word taught and preached, how are we going to know uh, where we need to change and, and what we need to alter in our life. James said the Word of God's like a mirror that we look into and, and we get a reflection of what we should look like in it. Now, we're not supposed to look like ourselves. Mind you now, I'm not talking about physical uh, perception. We're not supposed to look like what we think we're supposed to look like with all of our fleshly habits and carnal reasonings. We're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to look like Jesus. We're supposed to look like the Word. So the only way to determine how to look like the Word, since we're going to be judged by the Word, is to look into the Word and, and see, do we add up? We're going to be judged by the Word. So I think we should study the Word. John said, if anyone hears my words, this is actually Jesus talking. He said, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Isn't that awesome? Je Jesus said, if, if you hear me and don't accept me, I'm not judging you. I'm not condemning you. As a matter of fact, John 3.16 tells us that, that Jesus came into this world uh, to die for us, that we could have eternal life if we believe in him. And the very next verse, verse 17, he says he didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world. So this is the same thing here in John 12. He said, if you hear my words and don't keep them, I don't judge you. Because I didn't come to judge the world, I come to save the world. But if you don't need to read the next verse, you won't get the whole point. And the next verse says, the one who rejects me does not receive my words. He has a judge. Who's that judge? It's the word that I have spoken. That will judge him on the last day. Hmm. So Jesus said, I don't have to judge you personally. I don't have to condemn you personally. My word will judge you on the last day. If you reject Jesus, you reject his word. If you reject his word, then you're rejecting the very thing that's going to judge you in the last day. Your life and mine is going to be measured by the word of God. We need to study it so we know what we're going to be measured by. Hebrews chapter 12, or 4, excuse me, verse 12, says the Word of God is alive and active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrows. Watch this. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. It judges the thoughts and the attitude of the heart. Watch this. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. Nothing is hidden. Nothing is, is covered up. God sees it all and He is analyzing your life and making the comparison between it and the Word. We need to study the Word, friend, because we're going to be judged by the Word. We will have to give account. An account. Number three this evening, we study the Word because it is our weapon against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We study the Word because it is our weapon against the world, the flesh, and the devil. So this evening we've learned that it gives us knowledge and hope and eternal life. We've learned that we're going to be judged by the Word, and I think this is just as important as anything else we've learned, the Word of God is our weapon. And we definitely need a weapon in this world. It's a weapon against the world. It's a weapon against the flesh. It's a, a weapon against the devil. We are in a warfare here, whether we want to believe it or not, and it would do us good to understand our weapon. You know, one of the big things that I find out today, you know, Second Amendment rights, uh, they're real important to people. They're important to me. Um, I'm, I'm a... I'm a proud gun owner myself, as many of you are, and most here in the South and around the whole country, really, are. I'm a proud gun owner, and I'm thankful for that. Uh, but what you find out about a lot of people that uh, own guns that do not regularly 
shoot them uh, or take them out and, and study them and learn them. When, they come time, when it comes time for them to use it, they don't, they don't know what to do. Which one is the safety? Which one ejects the clip? Which one releases the slide? And, and, and all of these things that, that, that you're unaware of simply because you haven't utilized the weapon. Uh, now, I'm not, a, you know, uh, I'm not anybody to train anybody in handgun use. I don't have that kind of training. But I am smart enough uh, to know this but because of the personal weapons that I do own. If I don't take them out and shoot them from time to time, you get unfamiliar with them. If, if I don't use it, I, I get unfamiliar. And how terrible it would be to have to try to defend my family if, if someone were to come in on my home how terrible it would it be for me to try to defend my family and, and, and me uh, take up a weapon and, and can't remember where the safety is. Can't remember how to um, release the slide or, or can't remember, is this single action or double action? If I've got to pull the hammer back, what do I do? You know, it, that's a terrible thing when you don't know your weapon. Okay, um, the Word of God is our weapon. And I think one of the biggest problems in the church of today is that by far most people, they don't know their weapon. They don't know how to use it. They don't know how to apply, apply it. They've not read it. They've not studied it. They're not familiar with it. It's an awkward thing to them when they try to read it and try to use it. And then when the time comes in their life that they do need it and they try to take it up and use it, they, they, they feel funny, they don't understand, it's not comfortable in their hand, it's not comfortable in their mind, and it's simply because we haven't made ourselves familiar with the weapon that God has given us. And the only way you do that is by reading it and studying it and by hearing it preached and taught, just like we're doing uh, here this evening. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul tells the believer that he is to put on the spiritual armor of God. You're familiar with that. He tells us about the belt of truth and the blessed breastplate of righteousness. He tells us about the shoes of peace and the helmet of salvation. He says that we should take up the shield of faith to extinguish the fiery arrows of the evil one. And then he says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, since he's referring to armor, then we understand that this is a weapon. So the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, this is our weapon. This is our sword. This is what God has given us to use uh, as uh, our defense mechanism against the world, the flesh, and the devil. The sword was an essential part of that ancient warrior's armor. That soldier was considered ill-equipped if he had on every piece of armor. If he had every piece on but did not have his sword, he was considered ill-equipped. It was a swift and sure sentence of death to the soldier that didn't take up his sword. Imagine having all of that armor on. Imagine having the breastplate of righteousness. Imagine having the belt of truth. Imagine having the shoes of peace and the helmet of salvation. Imagine having the shield of faith, but you don't have the sword. You don't have the word of God. That makes you ill-equipped. If you've got everything else right and don't have the word of God, you are ill-equipped. Listen to me, friend. If you do everything, if you go to church, if you go to prayer meetings, if you give tithes and offerings and give to missions, if, if you work at the church, if you're on a cleaning team, a, a yard team, a maintenance team, whatever the case may be, even if, even if you're just a good old boy who is saved and born again, if you have not taken up the sword of the Spirit, you are ill-equipped. You are. It is necessary for you to take up the Word. And might I go ahead and say this. I believe absolutely that every time the church doors are open, the people of God ought to be there to worship and receive. But could I also tell you, if that's the only time that you hear the Word of God is when you come to church, you are ill-equipped. I, I know some are saying, well, preacher... Uh, then, then, then sounds like you're talking about the preachers and, and their preaching and their depth of, of teaching. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. What I am saying is, is if that's the only time you get the word, you're ill-equipped because you need to familiarize yourself with it every day, not just once a week or twice a week. 
You need to be familiar with it every day. If, if, if the Word of God is going to be a sword that you can masterfully uh, wield in uh, confrontation against the adversaries that you will face and your family will face in, in this life, spiritual and physical, if it's going to be a weapon that you're accustomed to, you're going to have to get used to putting that thing in your hands every day of your life. You're ill-equipped. If you've got everything, but you haven't taken up the sword, you're ill-equipped. Earlier in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 11, the instructions were given for us to put on the armor. He says, put on the whole armor. And basically what that means is don't leave anything out, especially the sword. Don't leave anything out. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. So I'm going to need this stuff. I'm going to need this weapon because I've got evil schemes that are set against me and my family and my church. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So I'm not fighting you and you're not fighting me and we're not fighting anybody else. We're fighting against the rulers, against the authorities, and this is spiritual rulers now, against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Basically, that sums up like this in a nutshell. We're fighting against the devil. We're fighting against the flesh. That's what we're fighting against. Anything inspired, anything that, that Satan can use against us, that's what we're fighting against. So he tells us then, therefore, take up the whole armor. He tells us again, get all of it. Don't leave one piece down. Don't get it all and leave the sword. Take every piece of it that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, then stand firm. Stand firm. So we need all of the armor, the sword included, if we're going to be able to stand firm in the evil day. Now what that tells me is, is that, that there are evil days before us still. There are circumstances that we're going to have to deal with. There are battles, there are fights, there are confrontations, there are things that we're going to have to contend with every day of our life from now till we die or Jesus comes. And the battle, when we read the Word, the battle is just going to increase in intensity. Paul stated emphatically that these enemies were there, we're going to face them, uh, we're going to have to deal with them, and we need to be ready to fight. We must not be incomplete. We must get the whole armor, and that includes getting the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, familiarizing ourselves with it. Paul also warned Timothy about the evil days that were ahead of him. And it would do us good to take notice of what Paul said to him because the same, I believe, applies to us today. The Bible very clearly states that in the last days there will be terrible and perilous times because the carnal nature of man is going to get worse and worse and more revealed than ever before. So if believers in Christ don't accept their responsibility of the Word of God, then our impact on society is going to be greatly limited and we're going to be more affected by the world than the world is by us. And we're going to be more affected by Satan's schemes than his schemes by us. Let, let's read what he told Timothy right here. It's amazing, this passage of Scripture, how it so looks like uh, the world of today. Now I'm going to read this from the Amplified Translation. So you'll see that there are phrases that are in brackets and parentheses. And what this is... When you see a phrase in brackets and parentheses in the Amplified Bible, it, it's actually giving you the definition of what's being said. So I'm going to read this and, and try to put these definitions in as we go. Watch what he says. He said, understand this. In the last days, dangerous times of great stress and trouble will come. It will be difficult days that will be hard to bear. So that's promised us. We're not promised a life of ease and a bed of roses. We're not promised that. We're promised that there will be difficult days that will be hard to bear. And this is why. For people will be lovers of self. That means they're going to be narcissistic. They're going to be controllers. They're going to think about no one but themselves. And, and no way but their way will be right. They will be narcissistic. They will be self-focused. People will be lovers of money. That is, they're impelled by greed. There will be boastful and arrogant revelers, disobedient to parents. They will be ungrateful, unholy, and profane. 
And they will be unloving. That is, they're going to be devoid of natural human affection. They're going to be calloused. They're going to be inhumane. They will be irreconcilable. They will be malicious gossips. Hello, Facebook and social media. Man, isn't it full of that? People will be devoid of self-control. They will be intemperate, immoral. They will be brutal, haters of good. They will be traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of sensual pleasure rather than lovers of God. And that seems to be the, what everybody is after today. They want things that please their senses and they love those things more than they do God. He said these people are holding to a form of outward godliness or religion. Although they have denied its power for their conduct nullifies their claim of faith. And this is what he said, avoid such people and keep away from them. Wow. Notice what he said. In all of those bad things we just read, this verse tells us they're going to look like Christians. They're, they're going to have a form of outward godliness. They're going to have a form of religion, but they have denied the power of true religion and faith to change them and, and alter their state. In other words, their profession of faith is not backed up by their actions. Their actions nullify their profession of faith. Isn't that something? He's not talking about just sinners out there. He's talking about some of these people are going to look like they're saved. They're going to look like Christians. Nonetheless, this gives us a picture of how evil, how awful, how horrendous these last days are going to be. He goes on to say further down in the chapter, we don't have time to read it all, he says, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Watch this. These people we were just talking about, all of these bad things that the devil's doing through them, watch what he said. Evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. So things are just digressing. Things are not getting better. Evil is getting worse and worse. And I believe the less that people read and study the Bible, the less like God they're going to be and the more like sin they're going to become. So the sinful nature of mankind then is going to be revealed more and more, ultimately appearing worse and worse. And all of this because men refuse to restrain their flesh and transform their minds by the Word of God. If people read the Word less and less, then please understand uh, they're going to look less and less like God and more and more like the flesh. And, and when people look more and more like the flesh, their actions and their deeds and their words are, are anything but godly. And that means the times that we live in are just going to digress and get worse and worse. And it means that uh, at least for appearance sake, that Satan's stronghold gets mightier and mightier and larger and larger. That's what the appearance is. And I believe every bit of it has to do with the fact that people are not using the Word of God. So we have a responsibility. Those of us that choose to use the Word of God, uh, we've got a responsibility to take up that sword, to use that sword, to fight against that evil nature not only around us, but to fight against that evil nature that wants to rise up within us because that nature of the flesh is in every one of us, friend. It's in you, it's in me. There is no bottom to the flesh if it is not restrained, if it is not cut off, and if we don't fight against it by the Word of God, there is no bottom to the flesh. You and I are capable of heinous things if we don't use the Word of God to fight against it. Oh, yeah. So it's imperative that we take up this sword. Look at some really frightening statistics concerning Bible reading and study in America. 88% of American households own a Bible. That sounds good. 88% own a Bible. The Bible is still uh, on the bestseller list. 88% of American households own a Bible. The average number of Bibles per household is 4.7, nearly five Bibles to the home. More than that, if you consider all these translations we have on our uh, mobile devices now. Well, watch this. While 88% of Americans own a Bible, 4.7 Bibles per household, notice this, only 62 or 62% 62 of Americans wish they read the Bible more. They don't know how to make time. Really? 
I mean, I understand the crunch for time, but when you know you need to do something, you find a way and you find a time and you do it. Look at this. This gets more frightening. 37% of Americans read the Bible once or more a week. 37%. 88% have a Bible in their home. As a matter of fact, nearly five Bibles in their home. 88%. And everybody has uh, access to one through mobile devices and phones and iPads and so on. And only 37% read it once a week. What is wrong with us? 81% of Americans say they believe that values and morals are declining in our nation, but they're blaming it on movies, music, and TV rather than the lack of Bible reading. I, I'm going to tell you what. I, I refuse to lay the, the, the credit for the decline at the feet of, of TV and music and movies and Hollywood. I, I refuse to lay it all at the feet uh, of that, this decline that we see in America. It's because that people, by and large, aren't reading the Word of God. We've replaced it with these things. I, I just do not believe that, that it's, it's safe to lay it all at the feet of that because then that means that these things are more powerful than the Word. No, these things are not more powerful. They never have been and they never will be. The reason these things are causing that is because we're not reading the Word. We're not studying the Word. We're not applying the Word. We're not focusing. Um, we don't care about preaching and teaching anymore in the, in the body of Christ. And, and that's where it began was there. Not in Hollywood. It began with our laying down of our sword. 56% of Americans believe the Bible is the actual inspired Word of God with no errors. Isn't that amazing? 88% of American homes have at least five Bibles in them, but only 56% of them believe that it's the actual inspired Word of God. That's terrible. That's terrible. If you're going to have something in your house, if you're going to own something, if you're going to possess something, I believe you ought to believe in it and sell out to it 100%. Lastly, the number of people that say they do not have enough time to read the Bible is increasing year after year after year after year. No wonder Paul told Timothy these things are going to get worse and worse. So sin and carnality are not gaining some new power in these last days. I believe people just simply aren't reading and studying the Bible because this is what keeps the sin nature under control. If we do not use the restraint of the Word of God, if we do not take up the sword of the Spirit and fight against this around us and in our own lives, it's just going to continue to grow. So this is what Paul told Timothy to do. As for you... Continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed knowing from whom you learned it. Continue in it. Keep moving forward. He said, continue reading it, continue studying it. Do this on a daily basis. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will and it'll be done. Jesus said, and you'll know the truth and the truth will make you free if you continue in it. So it's, it's, we've got to keep on taking up the sword of the Spirit. We can't do it just once in a while. We've got to keep on doing it. Paul went on and told this young man, he said that from a child you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. He had been taught it as a young man. Uh, his mom and his grandmother taught him. And now Paul says you've been taught it, but now you've got to continue in that. You can't lay it down. You can't quit it. Those things that you learned in Sunday school, those things that you learned in children's church, those things that you learned at, in kids' ministries and so on, in vacation Bible school, they do you no good if you're not going to continue in them like Paul told this young man. He said all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. Watch this. So the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is where we started talking about this point. Uh, we were talking about that ill-equipped soldier, remember, because he had everything but the sword. So if we want to be thoroughly equipped for every good work, it comes through continuance in the Word. We must continue in God's Word. We're going to face circumstances and situations. We're going to fight against devils and demons. We're going to fight against the flesh. We're going to fight against the world. We're going to fight all of these things and have to deal with it. And if we're going to overcome the battle, we're going to have to be thoroughly equipped. We're going to have to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want to leave you with this uh, this evening when... God gave Israel instructions in the Old Testament concerning His Word. 
uh, his commands that he had given them. He gave them some very strict orders. Moses talked about them. These words that I command you today shall be on your heart. Remember our text from the beginning, Psalm 119, 11? Your word have I hid in my heart. I've got to get it in my heart. It's not good enough just to get it in my ears or get it in my head. I've got to focus on it. I've got to study it. I've got to read it. I've got to hear it. I've got to apply it till I get it out of my head and I get it into my heart. It becomes part of who I am. These words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. That means I'm supposed to surround myself by it. It's in every part of my life. I teach my children. I talk about them while I'm in my house. I talk about them when I'm out of my house. I, I, I study it when I lie down. I study it when I rise up. I surround myself with the Word of God. That's how I get it in my heart. That's how I hide it in there. That's how I take up the sword of the Spirit. Bind them as a sign on your hand. They'll be as frontless between your eyes. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The Jews had these little things called phylacteries, and they would tie pieces of Scripture in these little phylacteries to their forehead and to their left arm. And some of them still practice this today. And, and this being tied to their forehead, it was frontlets between their eyes, and, and this being bound to their hand, everywhere they went it reminded them of the Word. They did something to remind them of the Word. They also had these little boxes they would put on the, the door of their house uh, to kill, coincide with verse 9 that was called uh, the mezuzah, or prayer boxes, and they would put these things on the side of their house and put scriptures in there. And when they would enter their house, they would kiss their two fingers and, and touch that box when they enter. And th this was just all a tradition that they held to surround themselves by the Word of God and to show their love for it because they knew how important it was. And they knew that it took this kind of effort to really get it in your heart. I mean, really, when you hear a sermon or hear something taught, really, how long is it in your head? I mean, really, I, I, I know who we are. I, I'm, I'm the same way. How long is it in your head? If you're not taking notes or like online, going back and listening to it again or doing something to apply it, really, how long does it stay in your head? Probably not long. As a matter of fact, a lot of people can't tell you on Sunday night what you preached on Sunday morning. That's just become human nature. But if we're really going to get the Word in us, we, we, we've got to apply it, surround ourselves with it. And, and God said there's a great promise to this. He said, in the future, when your children ask, what's the meaning of all of these words and all of this scripture and all of these testimonies? What's the meaning of these phylacteries that you're tying in between your head, uh, eyes and on your arm and these little mezuzah boxes? On, what, what's the meaning of all this? And, and he said, this is what you're to tell them. You're, you're to tell them that there was a time when we were slaves in Egypt. For us, it would be there's a time we were slaves to the sin. And the Lord did great and mighty things and showed great wonders against Egypt and brought us out. And He brought us out from there and He brought us to where we are today. And the Lord commanded us to keep these words, to do these words, to apply these words. And if we would do that, He would preserve us alive and it would cause good things and successful things to happen to us. And the reason we are alive today, the reason we have succeeded today, the reason we've made it today is because we have applied the Word, we have hid the Word in our heart. So <clears throat> that's, that's, the, that's the necessity of it. Hide it in your heart because there's promise to you, to your children, and to your children's children. Because everything you have in this life, everything you acquire, every blessing of God that comes every day comes because of His Word. It comes because of His Word. So we need to learn what it is to have this Word revealed to us through hiding. Apply it, people. Don't just, don't just let it go in one ear and out the other. Pay attention to what you hear. Pay attention to what you're taught. Pay attention to what's preached. Pay attention when you read. Pay attention when you study. Take up the sword of the Spirit. Let's don't be ill-equipped, but let's be thoroughly equipped so that we can combat the times that we live today against the world, the flesh, 
and the devil. If you'll apply God's word, I promise you it will be revealed as you hide it in your heart. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege of being able to know it and to understand it. Thank you for the truths that it is. Thank you for all that it does for us. I ask in the mighty name of Jesus that there would be an awakening in, in your people, uh, a desire for the Word, a desire to know it, a desire to receive it, a desire to hear it. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would just give us ears to hear, open our hearts to understand your Word and help us to apply it in every circumstance of life because we believe it's the key to everything that we need. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, thank you for joining us for Bible study here uh, this evening. Don't forget now this weekend uh, we have worship services at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock here on campus. Uh, if you're still unable to come or still not sure about coming out because of COVID-19, uh, we have a 10 o'clock worship service online. You can catch that on Facebook or uh, on YouTube. Also, check out our new website, AppletonAssembly.org. Uh, uh, we finally updated that thing, and we're going to be updating and changing it even uh, more in the days to come, but check that out. You can actually go on the website uh, and uh, uh, click on the link for either Facebook or YouTube and watch the services through that. So maybe if you don't have Facebook, you can go to the website, and if you want to watch it through Facebook, you can actually do that. It doesn't mean you have a Facebook account, but you can actually watch it through Facebook video, or you can do it through uh, YouTube uh, there as well. So make sure you go to our website, check it out. There's a lot of good things on there. We're going to keep adding to that thing, just believing God's going to do great things through it. Hey, God bless you. It's been a pleasure to be here with you this evening. I look forward to worshiping with you this weekend right here, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. Until then, have a blessed week.